We welcome you to this uh, lecture today. My name is John Rosenberg. I'm the Associate Academic Vice President for Undergraduate Studies. And my office, along with all of these other offices that you see on the slide, um, are working together to sponsor this series of lectures, The Choice to Believe by Professor Terrell Givens. Those of you uh, who were with us last month uh, recall that Professor Givens spoke on the doors of faith. Uh, today, uh, the lecture is uh, titled Awful Woundedness. On November 18th, uh, Terrell will speak about the grand plan of happiness and finally on December 9th, Worlds Without End. Um, we would also call your attention, for those of you who are matriculated students here, uh, to the fact that Professor Givens will be teaching a class winter semester, uh, literature and uh, belief and doubt, literature of belief and doubt. Uh, it's listed under H. Call, which is Humanities College, 480R. Class will be held on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons at 4 p.m. So we would encourage you to uh, sign up for that class while there is still, uh, while there's still room. Would also like to remind you that tomorrow we will have uh, a singular opportunity to hear from David Brooks, uh, New York Times columnist and political social commentator, who will be our forum speaker at 11.05 in the Marriott Center. And we have an added treat in that uh, Mr. Brooks is going to be accompanied by uh, his wife, Ann Snyder, um, prominent editor and commentator in her own right in the Wheatley Institution is sponsoring a lecture by uh, Ms. Snyder at 4 p.m. in the uh, Harold B. Lee Library Auditorium. We look forward to seeing you at those events. I asked Harold what he wanted to say, what he wanted me to say by way of introduction. He indicated that he thought a vocal solo would be fitting. Um, those of you who know me uh, will be happy that I am going to decline that invitation. I can uh, recall a moment uh, when Terrell and I were students together at Cornell University many, many years ago, and we both uh, studied with a particular professor, a man from Spain by the name of Ciriaco Moron Arroyo. And I can remember one day Terrell coming out of class uh, laughing a bit because Professor Arroyo, whose native language was Spanish, not English, upon reciting a poem that began, whoa, 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 read the poem as wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and I am uh, pleased to say that uh, in this time of whoa, 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 we have the good fortune of having Professor Gibbons with us here at BYU, wow, 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 and uh, we look forward to learning from, from him today. Uh, Professor Gibbons studied at BYU at Cornell at the University of North Carolina. Uh, taught at the University of Richmond for uh, several decades, and we now have the good fortune of uh, having him as a colleague on our campus as a senior research fellow in the Maxwell Institute. Uh, he is the author of many books. Uh, many of you have read his books, I am sure, by the hand of Mormon, uh, People of Paradox, Wrestling with the Angel, uh, most recently, The Pearl of Greatest Price, uh, all from Oxford University Press. Uh, and with his wife, Fiona, and Terrell's Fiona here today, I haven't, whom we will not recognize, uh, but whom uh, we acknowledge as a uh, partner with Terrell in his intellectual and spiritual journey. Uh, together, they are the, author, the authors of Crucible of Doubt, um, uh, The God Who Weeps and The God uh, Who Heals. That last title, The God Who Heals, strikes me as especially fitting given the topic of Terrell's lecture today, Awful Woundedness. And uh, just a couple of days ago, I had a very tender visit with a student in my office with whom I've become very close over the last couple of years who narrated to me a very difficult uh, life journey and her process of uh, working her way through those hard times. And at one point in our visit, she said to me, finally, I just made the choice to be healed. And that phrase resonated with me uh, in the context of Professor Given's series of lectures, The Choice to Believe. And now we have The Choice to Be Healed. Um, 
as a response to our recognition of the awful woundedness that is a part of the condition of uh, this mortal sojourn. So we are very grateful to Terrell for his willingness to prepare and to teach us today and uh, look forward to learning from him. We will have an opening prayer by Emma Whipple, a pre-nursing student. Thank you, Emma. And after uh, that invocation, uh, we will turn the podium to Professor Terrell Givens. The conclusion of his talk, there will be a few moments for some questions and answers. Sister Whipple. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day. We are thankful for thy Savior and his atonement in our lives. And we're thankful for this university and the opportunities that it provides us with. And we're thankful for Professor Gibbons and the lecture he has prepared to share with us today. And please bless that the spirit of learning will be here with us and that we will understand the messages that Professor Gibbons shares with us. And we love thee so very much, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for coming. It's a delight to be here again, and a special delight to be introduced by such a dear old friend as Dean Rosenberg. The other disciples said unto Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of his nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas, having done so, answered, My Lord and my God. How do we come to know Christ? And how do we recognize him and his presence in the world? Thomas came to know of the persisting reality of Jesus Christ, his lived presence in the world, when he actually felt his wounds. There's a logical symmetry here. We only know Christ, really know him, to the extent that we know what his love for us cost him. And so perhaps that is the primary mode by which Christ engages and knows us, by our wounds, by feeling our wounds. That would seem to be the meaning of his words, I have graven you upon my palms. We know of his wounds, we know him by his wounds as he knows us by ours. We are graven upon his palms, for he told us so. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. I will have more to say about the origin and the nature of those wounds in my next lecture. For now, suffice it to recall the vision in 1 Nephi that I have mentioned previously. Beholding a world captived by the teachings of a damaged scriptural inheritance, Nephi sees the inhabitants of the world as suffering in a state of awful woundedness. The angel imparting the vision did not draw his attention to human evil or wickedness, but to the state of awful woundedness in which we dwell. And the angel diagnosed the cause the loss of the scripture's plain and precious truths. It will be my contention today that the loss of two doctrines in particular and the creedal claims that replace them explain, at least in part, 
such pervasive spiritual damage. More than three decades ago, the great Methodist scholar Jan Ships argued that what she called Mormonism constitutes, in fact, a new religious tradition. I agree, not perhaps for the reasons she articulated, but because of its radical repair of traditional Christian notions of God and of the human. Restoration theology presented the world with something dramatically but resonantly different. As a people, we have underappreciated and therefore insufficiently represented to ourselves and to the world just how remarkably Latter-day Saint teachings depart from the views current in 1830. Today I will provide some context so you may better understand how transformative Joseph Smith's propositions were. And I will be focusing on two in particular. A father whose vulnerable heart beats in sympathy with our own, sharing our joys but also our pain. We also have a mother there. Heaven is not a patriarchal monopoly. And our soul is eternal, coming from a place of glory. So let's start with the first. Go with me back to the beginning, to that day in 1820, when the Lord employed disturbingly sharp language to characterize the contemporary Christian world. Their creeds were an abomination, he told the young boy. Note, first of all, that this was no condemnation of other Christians. It was an assessment of certain codified statements of belief. Second, notice that he did not specify which creeds were the target of his rebuke. I believe we can infer from his subsequent statements exactly which creeds Joseph believed were the culprit because he and Warren Cowdery and Parley Pratt and others all made reference to the very same creedal pronouncements as the source of so many of Christianity's ills. The most influential creed in the Protestant world has been the Westminster Confession of Faith. Approved by the English Parliament in 1648, this creed established the basis of Reformed theology embraced by the Puritans and the Presbyterians. This document served as the basis of Baptist and Congregationalist theology as well. Methodists employed the identical language in their 1801 Articles of Religion. And this is what the first sentence of that second article says. There is one only living and true God without body, parts, or passions. Now you need to know just what it means to claim that our God is a being devoid of passions. St. Augustine clarified this term almost two millennia ago when he asked, who can sanely say that God is touched by any misery? <laughs> Centuries later, Thomas Aquinas confirmed that to sorrow over the misery of others belongs not to God. Can you see why the Lord may have referred to documents affirming this slander against his nature? God, the claim is, feels no sorrow over your pain. He does not share your sadness and he is untouched by your loneliness. He persists in perfect equanimity, unfazed by the vicissitudes of your life, as unmoved by your suffering as he is unaffected by your joys. Such was the official teaching of virtually every Christian denomination on the planet when Joseph entered that sacred grove. Now you might wonder at this point why God would go to the trouble of creating beings whose pain and suffering cannot reach his heart. Well, that question has been asked and answered numerous times in the history of religious thought. 150 years after Christ, Tertullian taught that God brought forth from nothing this entire mass of our world with this array of elements, bodies, and spirits for the glory of his majesty. In the 17th century, the English Puritan Thomas Watson asked his congregation, what is the chief end of man? And he replied, man's chief end is to glorify God. According to the great American divine Jonathan Edwards, God always asks acts for his own glory. The first lesson of the Baltimore Catechism asked, why did God make you? And the answer, God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him. This view of God continues into the 21st century. One of the most popular preachers of our era writes, you were made for God's glory. 
An evangelical author of more than 40 books likewise states, God loves his own glory above all things. Now you need to let that sink in. Most moral philosophers and people of good sense would say that the highest right we have as human beings is to be treated as an I and not an it, a subject and not an object, a person with their own desires, interests, and intentions rather than as means to another person's ends. If that is correct, then anything that turns us into an it, an object, a means or instrument or vehicle of another person's interests or intentions would be evil. Virtually all, humans can be in, all human evils can be interpreted in the light of this basic premise. Think about it. Human trafficking, pornography, theft, fraud, rape, or more subtle evils such as flattery, high-pressure sales, emotional manipulation, these and a thousand other varieties of wrongdoing objectify and instrumentalize other human beings. What greater perversity could we imagine than to take a human being made in the likeness and image of God and reduce her or him to a mere object among objects, a rung on the ladder of our own self-interest, a stepping stone on the path to our own self-aggrandizement, or a disposable diversion in our pursuit of a self-serving aim. And yet, for centuries, theologians of all stripes and persuasions have had no problem imputing just that characteristic to our Heavenly Father. Let me illustrate with a story from the family life of Jonathan Edwards. Edwards may have terrified thousands with his portrait of an angry God who held sinners over the pit of hell, like loathsome spiders over a flame. But his own wife was drawn to a different version of God. On one occasion, when Jonathan Edwards was out of town, a local preacher named Peter Reynolds came to visit Sarah and her children, what we would call a ministering visit. And he offered to have a prayer with the family. And she agreed. Perhaps praying in the home of a famous preacher of fire and brimstone, Reynolds entreated God in tones that he thought Edwards might have approved of. In any event, Sarah was troubled, as she recorded in her diary. She recorded that while the Reverend was offering his prayer, she found herself feeling an earnest desire that in calling on God, he should say, Father. Then she asked herself, can I, with the confidence of a child, without the least misgiving of heart, call God Father? Pondering led to yearning. She felt a strong desire to be alone with God. She excused herself and withdrew to her chamber. In the moments that followed, she wrote, the presence of God was so near and so real that I could scarcely imagine anything else. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me as distinct persons, both manifesting their inconceivable loveliness and mildness and gentleness and their great immutable love to me. The peace and happiness which I hereupon felt was almost inexpressible. Sarah Edwards, we now know, was correct. Her insight was inspired. But her experience of the Father's approachability was in spite of, and not because of, the teachings on which she was reared. How many millions then, and continuing to the present, yearn for a reassuring contact with, intimacy with, and accepting embrace by a heavenly parent? Along with Sarah, other inspired figures sense the evil of such teachings. One inspired minister, Edward Beecher, wrote that of all errors, none are so fundamental and so wide-reaching re in their evil tendencies and results as errors with respect to the nature of God. Notice how similar his words are to those of the prophet Joseph, who said that a precondition for the exercise of efficacious faith was a true knowledge of God's character and attributes. And here, restoration teachings could not be more diametrically opposed to the Christian teachings of Joseph Smith's day. In the book of Job, the character Elihu asks in wonder, what is man that thou shouldst set thine heart upon him? The astounding fact that Joseph reveals is that God does set his heart upon us. To love, of course, is to be vulnerable. Parents as well as lovers have long learned this to their cost. We are never so vulnerable, remarked Freud, 
and that may be the only time you hear him invoked on campus. <laughs> we are never so vulnerable as when we love, and yet God chooses to love us. And if love means responsibility and sacrifice and vulnerability, then God's decision to love us is the most stupendously sublime moment in the history of time. It is God's response to the manifold creatures by whom he has surrounded the movement of his heart and will in the direction of those beings, us, that becomes the defining moment in his godliness and establishes the pattern of his divine activity. He, his freely made choice to inaugurate and sustain costly loving relationships is the very core of his divine identity. We find the most sublime scriptural evidence of this in Joseph's retelling of the book of Moses. The prophet Enoch is taken into heaven and records his ensuing vision. He sees Satan's dominion over the earth and God's unanticipated response to a world veiled in darkness. The God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people and he wept, and Enoch bare record of it, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as the rain upon the mountains? And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep? The question here, notice well, is not about the reason behind God's tears. Enoch does not ask, Why do you weep? But rather, How are your tears even possible, seeing thou art holy and from all eternity to all eternity? Clearly, Enoch, who believed God to be merciful and kind forever, did not expect that such a being could be moved to the point of distress by the suffering of his children. And so a third time he asks, how is it thou canst weep? The answer, it turns out, is that God is not exempt from emotional pain. On the contrary, God's pain is as infinite as his love. He weeps because he feels compassion. As the Lord explains to Enoch, unto my, thy brethren have I said and also given commandment that they should love one another and they should choose me their father, but behold, they are without affection and they hate their own blood and misery shall be their doom and the whole heavens shall weep over them. Wherefore should not the heavens weep, seeing these shall suffer. Notice again, it is not their wickedness, it is not their evil, it is not their disobedience, it is their misery. And it is their suffering that elicits the God of heaven's tears. Not until Gethsemane and Golgotha does the scriptural record reveal so unflinchingly the costly investment of God's love in his people, the price at which he placed his heart upon them. The question that should now appear in, on your faith horizon is why? Why should a God of perfect holiness make himself vulnerable to the lives and choices and suffering of a human progeny? Why did he create us? Or in Joseph Smith's original conception, adopt us as his children? Not for his own glory, as the universal Christian consensus has run outside restoration thought. Against those universally held beliefs, Moses 139 assumes the shocking power of inspired novelty. My work in glory is to bring about your immortality and eternal life, not my own. Or as Lehi teaches, men are that they might have joy. There is beauty and there is healing power in knowing that we have heavenly parents who are actually, truly invested in our happiness and in our sorrows. And there is a transformative freedom in recognizing that God has made our eternal happiness their personal project. We are free to believe that our happiness enhances their own, that they do not remove themselves from the human drama so as to render, render their eternal peace and joy immune to our struggles. If you do not realize the radical novelty of such a conception of God, it may be a result of the fact that decades after Joseph Smith's revelation of Enoch's encounter with the weeping God of heaven, there began a paradigm shift in the Christian community. The scholar Thomas Wynandy observed that toward the end of the 19th century, a sea change began to occur within Christian theology, such that at present many, if not most, Christian theologians hold it as axiomatic that God is passable, 
that he does undergo emotional changes and that he can suffer. Ronald Gertz has referred to the surge in theopashism, the affirmation of a suffering God, as a revolution marking a structural shift in the Christian mind. He says, we've only begun to see where systematic theologies rooting, rooted in the suffering God might lead. Paul Gavrilyuk states, there is now a remarkable consensus behind the idea that God might suffer. Latter-day Saint heresy, in other words, became by the century's end Christian orthodoxy. I made a public presentation to the, this effect at a Protestant seminary a few years ago. The dean of the College of Theology protested that his faith tradition had long taught the same truths. I asked him, are you familiar with your creeds? He paused a moment, then replied, well, we really don't pay attention to those. <laughs> that is good. So much the less woundedness, perhaps. The point is, Joseph Smith was open and receptive to those truths, once denounced as heresies, and now moving toward Christian consensus. What a treasure it is to have not just hopeful speculation on the subject, but sacred scripture revealed in the Restoration's infancy. I want to turn now to the second great truth emerging in the opening chapters of the Restoration, and that is the truth of our eternal identity. You probably recognize this painting here. It may be the greatest visual representation of the pre-existence that we have in the Western world. Um, I think it's particularly apt how apprehensive the expression on Eve's face as she realizes what is in store for the human race. The same text that, the ex that revealed the extent of God's profoundly felt empathy, the prophecy of Enoch, contained the first unmistakable basis for a specifically human pre-existence, leading to both poetic celebration and theological development of the theme. In Joseph Smith's account, Enoch learns in a vision about the spirits that God had created not visible to the natural eye and is told clearly and unambiguously, I am God. I made the world and men before they were in the flesh. Now, why is this idea so important? What theological and philosophical richness flow from this simple idea? And how may its recognition help to assuage the wounded condition of the human family? Well, first off, we could begin by asking, how far back does belief in our premortal existence go? And the answer is all the way to the beginning. Varieties of premortality exist in the very oldest creation narratives we know of, like the Mesopotamian story, Atrahasis. Plato explicated the belief in several of his dialogues. He used logic, analogy, and deduction to make his point, but he also relied upon the simple experience of falling in love. Human love, he was convinced, was an imperfect echo of an earlier knowledge of a more perfect beauty. Earlier, he believed, beauty was radiant to see at that time when the souls saw that blessed and spectacular vision. Now, beauty, as I said, was radiant among all the other objects, and now that we have come down here, we grasp it, but only sparkling through the clearest of our senses. It can only be so, he says, if it is experienced by one who has seen much in heaven. But how do we know that mortal love is not the real thing? Because, as he writes elsewhere, we spend our lives searching for someone to make us complete. And when two such lovers find each other, he writes, the two are struck from their senses by love, by a sense of belonging to one another and by desire, and they don't want to be separated from each other, even for one moment. These are the people who finish out their lives together, and yet, he concludes, a haunting lack persists. It is obvious that the soul of every lover hungers for something else. His soul cannot say what it is. Like an oracle, he has a sense of what he wants. And like an oracle, it hides behind a riddle. Augustine, founder of Western Christianity, believed the intimations were more definite we seek for a happiness that we intuit, he argued. And like the woman in the parable looking for a lost coin, he argued, we cannot seek for something that we have not already known. Talmudic sources, uh, where did my Talmudic source, there it is, this, no, this is it. Talmudic sources assign to the angel Gabriel the task of bringing spirits to the place appointed to enter their bodies. 
The picture on the left is one of my favorites. It comes from a 14th century manuscript in which we can actually see these are your little embryonic souls and they're being channeled down into the womb of an expectant mother. This is from a work by the great mystic Hildegard von Bingen. But back to Gabriel. Um, you yourselves might not remember that moment in your own past, but your body bears the imprint of your last moments in the spirit world. If you wouldn't mind, would you please all just locate the gentle cleft in your upper lip? It's called the philtrum. Now here's an Hasidic account of where that philtrum comes from. When a baby is conceived, an angel accompanies the soul into the womb. That angel is held to be the angel Gabriel. And in the blood-thumping shelter of the mother, angel and soul speak of the life to come and decide together on the purpose of your incarnation. What is this soul coming to contribute? Who will support this purpose? What challenges will be faced? Where comes love? There is, of course, a catch to all this thoughtful planning, because just as the birth pangs of your mother begin, when the soul must fully enter the baby self and the angel return to heaven, the angel reaches out and presses its finger against the baby's lip. We still have this mark, an indentation that runs sweetly from upper lip to nose. The philtrum is the angel's last gift. Hush, it whispers to the stirring child. Now you must forget. From Mesopotamian and classical sources alike, belief in the pre-existence made its way into the early Christian church. Origen was its principal and most powerful proponent. An early and vociferous opponent was the church father Tertullian in the second century. He got most things wrong. Tertullian thought pre-existence was a dangerous idea. It made us too like God, he warned. In the 17th century, a group of churchmen known as the Cambridge Platonists, and I'm skipping over hundreds of names, would answer Tertullian's query. Why should it be surprising, they reasoned, if the soul cannot recall all that has passed, when in the brief span of life we have again forgotten so much? For who can call to mind where he first saw the sun or felt the gentle wind? Henry Moore, the most prolific writer of this group, was sure there was proof of pre-existence in those traces that clearly do remain. The idea of a being absolutely and fully perfect is natural and essential to the soul of every man, and it cannot be washed out nor conveyed away by any force or trick. He wrote thousands of lines of poetry elaborating this doctrine of pre-existence as the most plausible explanation for this phenomenon, such as these lines. I would sing the pre-existency of the human soul, of souls and live once over again by recollection and quick memory all that has passed since first we all began. But all too shallow shall my wits be to scan a point so deep. A kindred spirit in this regard was Benjamin Witchcoat, who noted, no sooner doth the truth of God come to our soul's sight, but our soul knows her as her first and oldest acquaintance. Another of that group, Nathaniel Coverwell, in trying to account for human recognition of core truth, similarly refers to seeds of light scattered in the souls of man. When the eye of the soul looks out upon God, he says, it apprehends those beamings out of eternal and universal notions that flow from him as the fountain of light where they have dwelt from everlasting. Other thinkers from Descartes through the 19th century commonly invoked pre-existence to explain the innate sense of universals, of morality, and of God. Echoing the Cambridge writers, the philosopher Immanuel Kant confessed, <clears throat> two things fill me with wonder, the starry sky above and the moral law within. Where, he asked, could we have acquired that moral faculty which intuition told him was not a simple social or cultural acquisition? Kant would eventually come round to belief in the three existence by way of three separate arguments. His most unphilosophical sounding argument is based entirely on the human self of sense of self. It's not logical, not empirical, but it may be irrefutable. Kant asks this, does it make sense to believe that a being invested with an infinite potential, an eternal future, and a divine nature can be supposed to just spring into existence through casual sex or happenstance? It is difficult to believe in the eternal existence of a being whose life has first begun under so trivial circumstances. 
If we could see ourselves in other objects as they really are, he wrote, we should see ourselves in a world of spiritual natures which did, which did neither begin at birth, nor will they end with death. Like many philosophers and theologians of the 19th century, Kant also believed that pre-existence solved the dilemma of human will, of free will. Aristotle had first posed the problem that emerges if we are in fact created beings. Only that can be free which is cause of itself, he argued. What he means by that is if you make a batch of cookies and they taste awful, then that's your fault because you baked them. I know it was your husband, but we'll, we'll say it was you. And if you build a bridge and the bridge falls down the first time a car rides over it, then that was your fault because you designed and built the bridge. And similarly, if you created a human soul and that soul sins, then whose fault is it? By the same logic, it would have to be the creator of the human soul because he could have made the soul less susceptible of sin. <clears throat> Jonathan Edwards was once confronted with that problem, and he said, well, I acknowledge the problem, but nobody else has ever solved it either. <laughs> as late as the 20th century, we get to the great Cambridge philosopher James McTaggart Ellis. He saw the problem in, in these identical terms. If God created our spirits, he said he would be responsible for all our sins. Curiously, James McTaggart did not believe in God, but he did believe in the immortality of the human soul and in its pre-existence. And his argument was simple. Like Kant, he said, we feel guilt. And if we feel guilt, we know we could have acted differently. If we know we could have acted differently, then we know that we're free agents. And if we're free agents, we couldn't have been created. We have to have existed from time immemorial. So he found the free existence of the soul to be the only reasonable ground for both human freedom and human accountability. Let me end <clears throat> with a few remarks on why I think this doctrine, like that of a weeping God, can be a healing balm to us in our wounded condition. These poetic echoes evoke not just the reality of a realm of eternal truth behind the shadowy idols of the present, but a realm that beckons to us through faint traces of memory that pierce the long night of forgetfulness. The novelist and essayist Marilyn Robinson has referred to the odd privilege of existence as a coherent self, that haunting I who wakes us in the night wondering where time has gone, the I we waken to, sharply aware that we have been unfaithful to ourselves. We all know the sensation of having failed to live up to who we are, the sense that there exists a different I than the one sometimes manifest through our actions. This perception is even ingrained in the language of self-justification. I wasn't myself, we might say. Or, you are better than that, our mother might say. Who is this I we are referring to in such instances? Well, we could say it's just an idealized self we have failed to manifest, except the sense is too strong that it is our actions that are unreal or fall short of an actual standard that already exists in some form. In other words, is our most plausible candidate a hypothetical self we might someday be? Or what George MacDonald called an old soul, a self with a long history that provides the contrast with present patterns of behavior. One of the earliest church fathers, and he got most things right, was Clement of Alexandria, who lived in the second century. He felt only the second hypothesis could explain the remarkable decision of an individual to abruptly reverse the course of one's life in quest of a better. This, he reasoned, can only be because when we sin, we sense we are falling short of who we really are. And he believed only memory of the past, not imagination about the future, could be a credible prompt to such repentance. In the midst of lowly actions, our souls sometimes resonate with dim intimations of a heavenly past and evidence of a more supernal destiny than the one our poor choices foreshadow. As Clement wrote, we at some point come to a vague reminiscence of better things and desire to renounce our iniquities and speed back to that eternal light, children to the Father. By the sixth century, all such views as I have reviewed were consigned to the religious ash heap of heresy the doctrines, promoters, and teachers put under anathema. It was for the prophet Joseph to restore to Christian understanding one of the most resilient and most significant keys to self-understanding. 
Most importantly, perhaps, Joseph's restoration of the truth about our identity and our participation in premortal councils tells us these important facts. We are not helpless victims of fate cast ignominiously upon the shores of a hostile world. We participated in those decisions which led to this very Earth's creation. We counted the costs of a hazardous and harrowing venture here, and we gave our assent. And we did so for one reason, and it is a reason described by Robert Frost in his most inspired poem, which few of you have read. He described that scene in pre-mortal fields when very beautifully God limbed and tenderly life's little dream. And we, in response, gladly gave up paradise for some good we discerned. Because we trusted that heavenly parents would shepherd us home again to a richer and more abundant life than we could otherwise know. The world is indeed in a state of awful woundedness. As a bishop, I counseled with a couple who had, had more than their share of marital challenges. On one occasion, the wife said to me simply, we are just two broken people trying our best to love each other. We are all broken. We are all wounded. Our heavenly parents recognize our condition, and they have not left us comfortless. We have a restored knowledge of the most loving, empathic, and feeling God in religious history. And we have the gift of those intimations of our soul's home in the heavens from which we came and which beckons us to return. Our work is to participate with Christ in the healing work that such faith can inspire us to perform upon each other and upon a hurting world. I close with a prayer uttered by the prophet Brigham Young. May you, he said, cling to the principles of life that open eternity and reveal to us what we are, making known to us our relationship to God, which to the world is a great mystery. That is my prayer too, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.